Nothing we say here is investment advice, legal advice, life advice, or representative of the views of the organization we are part of or affiliated with. See chainabstracted.com for more information. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Chain Abstracted. It's a podcast brought to you by the Near Foundation, but it covers the entire Web3 ecosystem. Great to see you again, Alton. Nice to see you as well. One of the founders in the ecosystem. In this episode, uh, it was really cool. We interviewed Oleg from Sweat Economy. And he dove into a lot of really interesting things around the uh, movement economy. They have been doing this sort of real world application of crypto for a while. I mean, they, they started Sweatcoin in 2013, 2014, and then brought it on chain over time. So it's really interesting to see from the vision of like chain abstracted and how that works for these folks, because they're not the other way, right? They came from a sort of a web two based company uh, to launch a, a crypto product. It's not the other way where, you know, like, for example, Lear Protocol is like start as an L1 and then going back and says, hey, like we're not bigger, um, bigger, bigger sort of audience. Um, so my folks are different. And I think that gives us a bit of a different perspective as to what chain abstraction means. To some. Yeah, I agree. And the, the, what they're doing with it is super interesting. And Oleg's just, I, I like his, uh, the lens that he sees Web3 through, right? One area specifically is just like equating the physical activity economy to the attention economy you know like i was yeah. like oh i get it yeah and i think the other thing is like maybe i did this in the podcast too where you know sweat is just saying like you are basically storing your physical activity into a computer and not only into a computer but into a blockchain where you just say hey this is how much sweat coins i have which means if you do it correctly obviously he, he talked about bot prevention as well but if you do it correctly that means how you um how you store physical energy into into a bit or um, a computer. Bitcoin is similar, right? Bitcoin is more like, uh, yeah, you, you're burning some electricity to do proof of work and you store that as a as a source of, as, as Bitcoin, but Spycoin is kind of similar in a sense that rather than burning electricity, you're actually burning um, sweat. Totally, dude. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a great episode, everyone. And uh, we hope you enjoy. All right, well, let's just start first off because I know you probably said this a bunch, but just a, like a time, like what is your project at this day, right? Because it's constantly growing and getting more users and everything. We are not a typical Web3 project. We started 10 years ago in 2014. We wanted to be in Web3. Well, it wasn't called Web3 back then, but we wanted to build on blockchain. We couldn't. There was only one blockchain back then, Bitcoin, too slow, to cumbersome. No smart contracts, very hard to build on. So spoken to Vitalik in 2015, realized that we're going to have to wait, launch centralized, and the rest is history. By the time when blockchain technology got robust and fast enough, which was 2021, 2022, we already had more than 120 million users. And we've chosen near, as you know, after evaluating 14 different chains, and we'll probably talk about reasons uh, and drivers of uh, that decision, we'd be happy to share that. But why the project is developing so dynamically and why we have so many users is for two reasons. One is great mission. Actually, you know, people really subscribe to it, making the world more physically active. Everyone knows that they need to be more physically active. Everyone gags for it. Very few people find enough motivation. And the second thing is that we're focusing on developing beautiful stuff that is just pleasure to use. And we're focusing on the mobile. So you combine the two and you end up having a beautiful product that, you know, is very sticky, is very easy to join. And therefore, you know, 90% of all of our growth has always been word of mouth because it's quite amazing. We pay you to walk and people are like, hmm, what, what does it, how do I join? And, you know, then they go like, Look, these guys are paying you to walk. Really? True. You know, go and install it. They install it and go, whoa, that, that's work. And then they talk to the next person. So virality and the attractiveness of the product and simplicity of it has been a major driver. And as you know, we are one of the largest projects right now building on Neuro. Well, actually, in the whole Web3, in Dup Radar, we're consistently in top three, top five uh, projects in terms of active users. And we know that our users are not bots. So yeah, making the world more physically active and welfare at the same time. Let's talk about your application. So you have a wallet, which I think lives as a mobile app. Uh, can you break down for us and we can maybe go deeper into, into some of the cool things that you guys are have and you guys will be building. I know that 
you guys had a great um, showcase in Denver in the chain abstraction. Mm. Right. So, oh, now chain abstraction sneaks into a conversation. Yeah, but let's start several steps back, right? So what we do is we track your movement, we verify it, and if it is genuine, then we convert it into either sweat coins, which are our kind of legacy point system that lives in sweat coin app, which is, you know, pedometer with humongous benefits. And that's why we have such a huge adoption because there are plenty of pedometers, but all they give you is number, maybe a bit of distance, maybe calories. We, you know, offered you an opportunity to monetize and convert your steps into value. Then when we found near and realized that we can actually move into crypto, we were too late to turn sweat coins, which were by then already seven, eight years old into crypto because the change in token economics in user experience is going to be too drastic. And I did not want to go right from yesterday to today, everything is going to change. And also in some geographies, people are not allowed to own crypto. So all of a sudden pushing the whole world and, you know, kind of pushing people into, you know, violating law of that country because we made this decision would be really silly. So we realized that we needed to create a second currency and second application. So now the user chooses, do they walk for sweat coins? centralized, you know, marketplace, you know, there's a lot of gamification around that, or they walk into crypto. And this is exactly how our users, crypto users describe us. You know, you can literally walk into crypto, you move your feet, you get free app, and all of a sudden you start earning by being physically active. And that app is Sweat Wallet. When you earn Sweat, that's where Sweat comes and that's where utility of sweat resides so what can you do with sweat you can win rewards we already had two teslas one we had a lot of you know basically more than several hundred thousand two hundred thousand plus rewards have been given and how you participate in those rewards is based on the amount of sweat that you stake then there is Staking, and I'm using this vocabulary because, you know, the audience here is going to be crypto native or familiar with the lingo, but the way we describe it to our users, grow jars, because frankly, staking is not a, you know, kind of a word that intuitively describes what it is, which is kind of savings account or, you know, kind of something that pays you yield. People put sweat into a jar and it grows. Amazing. So we have more than a million people that have created jars. The more you stake, the more you earn and bigger rewards you can win. And we've been consistently experimenting with GameFi as well. So we have Sweat Hero, we have Trivia, we have Spin and Win, because we realize that actually gamification and games is an incredibly valuable tool to engage young audience, which is where we're focusing but also give them an opportunity to do something when they're not necessarily moving. So when you're moving, it's great. It works because you monetize your physical activity. But if you're sitting there and you look at your balance, what else can you do? You know, how else can you engage these people and remind them that movement has value so they don't forget about you and they don't forget to walk more. So that's basically, you know, kind of the, in a nutshell, it. And this is what we have. Of course, we're going to be talking about the roadmap and, you know, you mentioned chain abstraction. I'm sure that, you know, there are a few announcements and very interesting ideas that yeah. we're going to talk about there. I have a question there. So um, you mentioned like accounts being genuine. How do you guys do that? So I know that Jared runs a, Jared is like post this link online and everybody just gets like, hey, we want to claim this NFT uh, through Shardog, right? Like what's the, what's the mechanism there that you guys use? Yeah. Look, as please, I mentioned with please tell us, please so we can share. <laughs> I'll tell, I'll tell you us. enough for you okay. to be confident that okay. it works. Yeah. I'm not gonna give you enough to figure out how okay. to screw <laughs> with it. Totally. <laughs> right. Totally. No, because it's a you know, can it, it's a it, it it's a race. But fundamentally when we started the project, the first thing that we realized is as soon as you start 
paying people to walk. First thing they do is shake the phone. They put the phone on a dog. They put the phone on a dishwasher. People put phone on the rope and they rotate it over the head. They put it on a drill, metronome. I mean, the countless, countless use cases are just absolutely phenomenal. There is even a website that's called unfitbits.com that teaches you how to screw with your wearables and with your phone to believe that you're physically active. So we've done all of that and then quite a lot more. And the way we addressed it is, I mean, we have three levels of sort of defense. And in broad terms, it is securing the data, securing data in the state, securing data in transition, and also a very, very sophisticated model that analyzes all the data arriving. And the reason why the whole thing works is because we know that you cannot solve this problem fundamentally and for forever. So it's a race. We have a fraud team. So in banks, fraud team is about, you know, people trying to defraud money. Our fraud team is busy to make sure that there is no sweat given them without users sweating. So they focus on the data indicating the movement being genuine. And how it works is, you know, kind of with 160, 54 million users that we have right now in 10 years of history, you can imagine that we have an incredible sort of training sample. And if there is an anomaly, doesn't go through anomalies are getting flagged and we analyze them i mean it used to be even me sometimes i would kind of go look you know dear user you know we're seeing something really really strange how you know kind of how do we interpret this data what's going on here and then depending on the outcome and the analysis and the kind of human intervention then we decide okay this is rejected this is going through so we know that there is always small percentage of people that are inventing funky ways of shaking their phones. But on a very fundamental level, we had to make a decision that the amount of physical activity that we accept per day needs to be capped because you wouldn't want somebody to jump up and kind of go, oh, right, I'm going to get rich by walking. And all of a sudden, you know, they jump up from the sofa and go and take 100,000 steps and then up in hospital. You know, you don't want that outcome, right? So you actually want to cap it at a healthy level. And we capped it at 10,000 steps, which is universally accepted. Really, really good active day. If you're on premium level, you can push it to 20, which is also a very, very sort of reasonable and accepted level that is not an overexertion. And after that, we simply don't accept the data. There is no motivation. And what does it mean for broad civil attack and analysis? that it doesn't make freaking sense to have one account where you manage to figure out some funky way of shaking. You start scaling horizontally. And as soon as you start scaling horizontally, this is like a, you know, kind of big bells ringing because that is extremely easy to detect and extremely easy to stop right away. And you stop the whole thing. So do we have single accounts that might've figured out some funky stuff? Yes. Do we have fraud that can be at scale? No. And coming back to your original question, how do we know that these are real humans? Is because we know, looking at the data, if it is a real human or it is, you know, kind of generated in shop. Randomness of humans is unparalleled. Look, we can't that. take freaking same step twice. So it's beautiful. Oleg, dude, I'm going to unpack some of this, what we've talked about, because you've got, you've said so many jewels that I just want to like hone in on. So the, the anti-botting and all that, man, I'm so envious of your user uh, amount because you really get to get that info. And at, at 160, how many? 160? 154 million users and counting. Right. 154 million like users. You've got like a whole beautiful data set, which is really cool. Second, yeah. so that's cool. So that's really cool to hear that and to know that you guys are on it because I think the most important thing in Web3 is like, like you said, once people realize they can earn to walk, the oh, next oh. step in Web3 is how to game it. So totally understand that. Second, I'm on the uh, sweat wallet right now because, you know, there's the yeah. app, there's the wallet. So people I'm trying to, and man, 
claiming the Ibiza trip. Boom, dude, I'm always constantly claiming these things. So, you know what I mean? I got my jars. Yeah. So, uh, we'll see. I, I'm, I'm in the Ibiza. We'll see. But like you're giving away MacBook Pros, like everything. Um, yeah. How, uh, I don't know if you want to go deep into that, but I was curious, like, how does that business model, mm. uh, like, how does that work? work? Or I don't know if you want to go too deep, but it doesn't have to be too long of a question. I'm just curious personally, but. No, uh, even before we went into Web3, we were profitable for a number of years. And this was a bit of a shock to a lot of investors that we've spoken to early, like 2014, 2015, 2016, when a lot of them said, it's a charity, you're going to pay people to walk. You know, can, what kind of business is there? So by 2019, we became profitable. And there are three models that work really, really well in Web3. One is partnerships, because you'd be surprised how many brands want to get in front of physically active people or those that are becoming physically active and just starting their journey. And if your sports, health, fitness, nutrition, healthy food, dog accessories brand, we give you a wonderful opportunity to talk to users that are, you know, kind of your just gold dust. They, you know, your target audience. Alternative is to go through Facebook or Google, but even there, all you know is likeness of, or if users like certain brands, but do they like Adidas or Nike because they do sport or do they just use them as a lifestyle brand? So with us, you can target ultramarathon runners with one offer, those that are very, very active with another, and those that are starting their journey with a third. So anything that is associated with shape, and that also results in mind and body and spirit. So fashion brands, for example, are having absolutely amazing time on Sweatcoin. So that's one revenue stream. The other revenue stream is advertising and we have, you know, and I hate advertising. I block advertising absolutely everywhere, but we actually figured out how to do advertising in such way that our premium users that will get to use more or watch more advertising than those that are on free, which is normally primary reason why I buy premium subscription. So we restricted the amount of ads or content that people can get exposed to. And in order to unlock the next ad, you actually have to walk, which is almost counterintuitive. But that resulted in, first of all, a lot of interaction. Second, very serious engagement with this content. And our click-throughs and engagement is one of the best in the industry. And we earn a lot of money through that channel. And of course, third one is premium subscriptions. Now, Web3 added a whole plethora of additional revenue stream, transactions fees, swap fees, et cetera, et cetera, because we have our own financial asset and now we're generating revenue in fiat, in tokens, but also in sweat. So Web3 business model long-term is even more robust, even though in Web3 we're not yet profitable because this is a very nascent industry, you know, quite a lot of business models are not yet recognized. And, you know, people are still kind of going like, what? You know, can I, I can acquire users through you? I can attract users through you to my project? Oh, you know, how does it work? And there is no established price points. But we know that the Web3 business model is even more robust than Web2 in the long run. Totally. And you just answered the question I was going to ask is like, why Web3? But here's a question. I'm just to, I saw you want to talk to. Oh, recently. no, 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 no. We didn't come to Web3 for the business model. <laughs> That's an icing on the cake. Got you. Yeah, no, totally. And um, I wanted to say, I saw you give a talk recently where you talked about data. And I think yeah. it's, you said that you don't deal with the data. If you want to just uh, reiterate what you said there, I thought it was a really great point and it's important for people to understand. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. When we started the, you know, there are a lot of people out there that always think, how are they screwing me? You know, kind of how they're making money. That must be something kind of negative, right? And it took a long time to explain to people that, you know what? We never sold data. We don't sell data. We never sell. We never will sell data. Actually, one of the reasons why we reside in Europe and why our servers are located in Europe and all the data kept on them is governed by GDPR 
is because we want to make sure that no matter what angle you take or kind of whatever assumptions you make, that you know that we are compliant with the probably most draconian privacy protection laws in the world. And frankly, you know, it's my personal belief that if you're trying to make the world more physically active, selling data is going to be the last thing that you want to do because you are going to limit number of people that will come to you. Selling data is ugly business. You know, well, it's not as wrong. bad as porn. Uh, you know, some people probably would argue that it's worse because, you know, um, it's stealing something that is inherently private that belongs to people and putting, you know, earning money from it and not sharing it any further. So this has always been our ethos. And, you know, as I told you, we have three business models. They work extremely well. We don't really need to screw with data because of ethics, but also from legal perspective. So, you know, can we have double whammy there? What we do realize is this data is extremely valuable. When lockdowns happened, we saw that Spain, for example, that had one of the most draconian lockdowns in the world, lost 85% of all physical activity in the period of 24 hours. And if you really think about it, you can recalculate that into extra kilos of fat, into extra healthcare costs. This was the data that was extremely interesting. We got on TV in Turkey, actually, in televised debates where they had an argument over should we have lockdowns or shouldn't we have lockdowns? And they used our published data to basically substantiate that, you know, do we really want to cause so much damage to people, you know, because of this thing? It was really funky time, but what it gave us, it gave us an understanding that the data is extremely valuable. And what we are looking for is in the long run, we will partner with one of the major data unions that we've already spoken to. And we know that they can provide that middle layer that would allow you, the user, the owner of the data, to flick the switch and basically liberate the data that is right now invisible to anyone and make it analyzable. And that will cost money. Effectively running queries or taking chunks of data from the database will have to be paid in sweat. And those that open the data will be earning the bulk of it. The rest will go to all token holders and effectively adding token utility to sweat and increasing its value. Oh, this is quite interesting. I mean, we, we don't talk to, well, we don't talk to app, as many apps as we should. So that's one, I guess, like we, we talk to here, actually. The second one is like, we don't talk to that many apps that make money in crypto. So that's, that's nice. That's, that's the, nice to talk to or like about it. Um, I had a bit of a lingering question from the, the time that we discussed at the product side, um, you guys have decided to go build an application on an L, pretty much an L1, right? To grow an L1 um, in, in 2021, 2022, and now as well. Um, there's this other sort of trend where you see apps like yours trying to launch their own chain. So what do you think about that decision, right? As it, if you were to launch it today, like, do you think it makes sense for you as an app or is it just like, I don't really care. I care about more of my users and, you know, um, how, how do you think about that in general? There's a big question and there's a lot to unpack there. Um, when I was in Dubai, there were three major, you know, kind of well-known characters that, you know, are capital allocators that told me that you should consider launching your own uh, layer one. And the reason for it is because it's actually, this narrative allows you, allows you to really quickly raise money because from capital allocators perspective, infrastructure layer one, layer two, layer three, um, bridging, et cetera, is the area that, you know, historically has been making money. I laugh at it. And I'll explain why, because last week I was at the party, 20 people, you know, very, very senior founders or, you know, kind of very senior people in large web three organizations, four out of 20 building layer ones that have not hit the market. And if you start digging into it, 
There's no real narrative. There is no real niche, but you can raise money to build layer one or layer two. What does it tell you? It tells you that we are in a significant bubble of infrastructure investment. And if you start drawing parallels with any other industry that you can come up with right now, you would realize that every industry, when it emerges, goes through a cycle of infrastructure investment, but then something happens and infrastructure stops being, being the focus. More than that, infrastructure is barely making any money. Let's look at internet. Until about 2000s, all the money and all the glory was on microsystems, silicon graphics, data centers, cables, fiber, etc. Around year 2000, capital allocators went hmm, and they changed success metric to active users that gave birth to Google in 2003, Facebook in 2007. And notice what is big tech and where money are made or returns on investments are made. And infrastructure right now is getting paid what front ends and those that control the relationship with users give them. There is no chance that infrastructure is the crux and the center point of capital allocation. Now let's go back. TV. Where did TV start? Towers, cables, TV sets. All the investments went there. Black to color, amazing. Now, what is made on TVs right now? They are loss leaders for hardware manufacturers. Where is money made in TV? Content, channels, engagement, advertising. Radio, same thing. You go all the way back to probably the best industry that we have some understanding of, industrial revolution. If you look at industrial revolution, first few tens of years, everything, virtually everything went into railways. UK had hundreds of railway companies that connected absolutely everything until in 1900s, they kind of looked at it and realized that 30% of them are not getting any usage whatsoever. Now, how much money is made in railways right now? They're subsidized. Industrial revolution started with infrastructure investment, then it flipped on its head and it became consumer goods, etc., etc. We are at the brink of going through exactly the same thing. Infrastructure investment is going to stutter, is not going to give you returns. And frankly, if you build so many fucking railways, you need trains and you need carriages and you need people using them because why would you have it otherwise? How are you going to make money on this, right? So that's my thesis. I can see that infrastructure is continuing to attract investment. I see Chile's building their own layer one. I see other apps doing their own layer one. To be honest, you know, it's a huge mistake because world doesn't need more rails. Right now, we need trains and carriages and beautiful products that are starting to use infrastructure already built. Is it going to happen within six months? Is it going to happen within 12 months? That I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. But that it will happen is inevitable. And the only infrastructure projects or layer ones that will survive in the long run are going to be the fastest and the most secure or the cheapest and everything else will go by the way of dodo well wow, that's great i think also vcs need to change how they value companies right if you think about it right you go with an l1 l2 they're like well this is this is 200 million fdv for you versus i have a very good friend who's like you know building something really interesting on the nfts has a lot of users in tvl and they're like well we're gonna value at 20 right it's like so that is probably that will shift in the future. No, that's that that's actually a great segue into chain abstraction, pretty much, right? Like thinking about all, <laughs> all yeah. of being abstracted. Uh, love to take your view on first. What's chain abstraction for sweat? What does that mean, right? Started with near. Now, like I guess focusing on that with the near ecosystem. How do you see it yourself? Continuing what I was saying before. 
if there is a flip from infrastructure, what is that going to flip to? And looking at every other industry, it ends up being products that engage and solve problems of end users, right? Web3 inherently is about ownership and control of assets that either did not exist before or were in trusted management of a party, the bank, you know, but we just didn't have mechanisms that could ensure your ownership and control of assets. And if we think about it, that means that it will flip into consumer crypto. And if you look at analogies with internet, the flip to consumer crypto is going to happen faster and will be even more pronounced because keys control assets, humans control keys. So the interface that gives you the best experience to store your keys, have complete view of your portfolio and complete freedom to manage that portfolio is going to be the product that will control all the future value that will have an opportunity to charge fee here, fee there. And with a plethora of infrastructure projects and layer ones, it's going to be such an oversupply of rails that you can channel your assets through that it is going to be the game of survival of the fittest and consolidation. Ultimately in the future, users, unlike now, are not going to live on Solana Island or on Ethereum Island or on Arbitrum Island. They will have assets and they wouldn't even know what chains those assets reside on. As long as I have control over the, those assets and they're secure, why would I care? When I use an app right now, I can't give a flying fuck if it's built on AWS or on GCP or on Azure, as long as it works. Why do we think that it's going to be any different with the underlying technology that actually just powers transition and movement of assets? We won't. What you'll care about is security and ease of the interface that holds your keys and gives you full control of the assets that you have on whatever chain. You can clearly see where I'm driving with this and where chain signatures are coming from. If we are thinking that front ends and end user products, consumer crypto is going to be the focal point of next investment cycle and next innovation wave, then those that control keys and those that build beautiful products and on the mobile, because you know what? So few people in the world have laptop, live along desktop, that we just need to acknowledge that unless we build on mobile, you're not building for mass market. You're not growing your pie. You're appealing to the same group of people that probably already has liquidity in another protocol. So chain signatures is 10 times better than MPC as an approach because rather than having multiple keys on the front end, managing multiple accounts on different chains, it gives you one key that manages all of that. And from security perspective, I need to worry about one key and one key only. Everything else is hidden and secure. That gives us an opportunity to develop an incredible and very, very simple user interface. Because if everything is managed through one key, then there is a unified way of pulling the data and pushing the data out, which means that I wouldn't have to kind of jump through hoops and present you various different screens, depending on what chain your assets are on. And the third thing that I find incredibly valuable here is that it basically turns near, not into an infrastructure play, not being in a bloodbath with everybody else fighting for the cheapest or the fastest chain, but it gives an incredible role in powering front-end. Front-end plays 
So we are one of them, but I'm sure that there will be plenty others that will realize, holy moly, <laughs> you know, why don't we build a near when it gives me out of the box cross-chain and multi-chain functionality and our users need to think about one key rather than a gazillion of them. So that's why we already integrated BNB or BSC chain. It hasn't been rolled out just for one simple reason. It's a big thing and your team, your technical team is going through audits and they, they would feel a lot more comfortable for us to push the button and roll it out 100% when that is complete. And this is a question of weeks. We're ready and I just can't wait to, you know, enable this and, you know, get the first ball rolling and let the world know this is this is the way future looks. This is really interesting in the sense like and Alton, you start to see like we've been talking to a lot of different projects about chain abstraction. And th there's this thing that's starting to happen, which is a beautiful sort of visual. So you've got your your app or train. <laughs> I love the, the train thing. I'm telling you, I'm going to I'm going to riff on that. I love that train analogy. And People then right call from, ones rails. Yeah, exactly. And rails then, need trains. Yeah, and a train will take any rail it needs to to get to where it needs to go. So you've got your app, and then you've got the chain abstraction layer. And there might be a couple, but near seems near is the one that's really. I think their account model and all, also their wallet is a smart contract in itself, right? So there's like some certain like tech advantages that near has. That is that app is that chain abstraction layer. Then below I can that. give you some illustrations of that. Okay. So near account structure is incredible because you can have an unlimited number of keys on the front. So you have account obstruction that, you know, in EVM world requires an additional product bolt on that you need to build, etc. Here it comes out of the box. What does it enable? It enables, you know, kind of from the crypto curious person perspective like a simple product i can issue you a card straight in the wallet that will go into your apple pay but in the background all that will happen is that an additional key with limited characteristics are going to be issued so you say you know 10 grand a month not more than 50 uh dollars per transaction you know all of those parameters that you determine in the card that just describes a key that is issued to that smart contract. And all of a sudden, you can use your crypto without having to put, so convert it into stable coins, put it in a different account, which is a deposit, which is really annoying because basically you say, spend two grand to be able to spend it on a card. Like, why do I have to spend two grand? I just want to, you know, have debit card. I tap money that I have goes out. And I don't want to bother what currency or tokens I'm keeping them in. So the account structure and unlimited number of keys gives that as a product that you can build out of the box. Other chains simply can't do that. It's impossible to build this product on EVM. So now on the flip side, having an ability to have unlimited number of smart contracts hanging off that account gives you an opportunity to, you know, basically build portfolio of things starting from access to other chain. But if you're starting to think about the merger of blockchain and AI and assets, you're starting to think about personal agents that, you know, can have access or ability to manipulate financial assets. So, you know, kind of it's, it is absolutely incredible and, you know, it's a blessing that Nier came slightly later and have already picked up, you know, signals and pulled them together because if you start looking in aggregate, you know, Nier product is so phenomenally strong and has the highest chance of actually delivering that vision that is inevitable. You know, the question of flipping from infrastructure to consumer crypto is not a question if, it's a question when. And then most layer ones and layer twos are going to have nothing to offer. And they will just have to compete or buy each other or consolidate or just drive their innovation to absolute bare bones optimization to drive costs down, to increase speed. 
Nier's got an incredible reason to basically go up and provide that top layer that abstracts all other chains and provides good user experience to the end users and power all of these different wallets and apps that will be, you know, controlling those keys and managing those assets for humans of the world. So Nier's Depends. wallet is truly unique, <laughs> like, which I think from a, a non-techno person myself, I think that's really interesting, like, because I think wallet almost is like a miss labeling of how uh, much it can do a wallet minimizes the true potential of a near wallet yeah but there is one thing that is not there is focus on the mobile ah uh, okay because in order to, in order to build in order to build products for the next billion people you have to think mobile 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 and web doesn't even factor in because People around the world, every single one of them, I traveled through Africa, you know, remote part of Tanzania and, you know, kind of local cattle herders, they have cheap Android. In their village, they have one big solar panel and everyone charges their phones. They don't have electricity in their houses, but they have cheap Android and they prefer apps to mobile web. So... You know, kind of, if we want to bring next billion people, it has to be mobile, mobile, mobile. Absolutely. And another thing that we really need is, it's like with internet, we need capital allocators to realize that the reason why we're not progressing as fast as we want is because of one seemingly stupid thing that everyone focuses on TVL as a metric, right? If... And I've seen a lot of pitches. If you're building products for the next billion people, but your success metric is TVL, I know that you're going to fail on your first step, on your mission. Why? Because you start building a product, and then you realize that you can hit that TVL target by making five phone calls. And then you need a product that would cater to those five people that can bring that TVL target. And guess what? They already have their TVL on other protocols. And what they want is a copy of that protocol, just high yield. And then you end up replicating all that legacy shit and drag it into the future. And then you try to attract more people, but they can't even understand what the hell it is because it's catering to five people that's been doing it for years and years. So if you focus on TVL, you can't build products of the future. In order to build products of the future, you need to focus on active users. And that is big shift that hasn't happened yet. And when it happens, and when more people are starting to think that way, we will have more founders not giving you a pitch deck that I'll build another layer one with some God knows what differentiation and the purpose, but they'll start thinking, okay, what can I build using this infrastructure that will attract billion people? And right now, nobody's doing that because even if I had that business plan, I can't raise money because people are like, you know, if you were to bring me a layer one business plan, I'll give you money. But, you know, that fucked up shit, you know, you just pie in the sky. No, yeah. So, you know, it's capital allocators. When that will, you know, when that switch goes, that's will, you know, that's when we're going to start seeing innovation and real explosion of new consumer crypto products. And our mission and our goal is to make sure that we are advanced enough and at scale that will automatically put us at the crest of that wave to be beneficiaries of all of that capital that will undoubtedly come into this field. Let's wrap our head around, like, how does that future look like for, for Sweat? I guess you have the users, you have the active users. Now you're building this thing with BNB. If you were to look at Sweat in two years, like, where do you want to be as the sweat economy grows? Great question. Um, as I said, my thesis is that the key thing is to build beautiful, usable, secure products that give humans a way to control assets, no matter what chain they're on. And this is where we're going with Sweat Wallet. The wallet market right now is extremely difficult because if you actually look deep into differentiation between wallets there is very very little that they can offer right 
And therefore, the first mover, like MetaMask with Trust Wallet, are kind of having control over the market. Now, where we have a very interesting proposition is that, okay, that's your asset management tool, but Sweat Wallet gives you an opportunity to tokenize and monetize your physical activity. And people view it as a separate app that they're happy to have because it's a free application that tokenizes your physical activity and gives it value. And I can build all these different things around it. In the process, they discover that this is a fully fledged, extremely easy to use and secure non-custodial wallet. And all of a sudden, like, why would I have complexity? Why would I be managing my liquidity here, there, everywhere, and managing a lot of keys and a lot of wallets when I can actually consolidate my liquidity? So the vision that I have is that we'll be a significant player in the non-custodial wallet space because we know how to build those apps. We know how to make them secure and chain signatures help to do it inherently more secure by giving you just one key as opposed to mechanisms by which you're managing plethora of keys. And ultimately, I believe that if the promise and the vision of Ilya and Alex Kidanov and their kind of original start of this business as AI comes to fruition, I see an incredible value for anybody who's got liquidity on any chain to start consolidating it either on near or keeping it on that chain, but under the key of near, because you can see humongous efficiencies that can be derived from AI and advanced and very fast analysis of on-chain data that have not been implemented. And one-click deployment, complex deployment of liquidity in that scenario is going to be extremely easy. And NEAR is the only chain that will be able to recommend liquidity deployment on other chains. Because if you are Arbitrum, you are not going to go, oh, there is a, you know, airdrop opportunity on Solana. You'd be crazy to recommend that. Near can easily do that because, you know, with chain signatures, yes, that TVL will reside on a different chain. But if that TVL is controlled by near key, whose TVL is that? Where would you count it? And ultimately, we need to stop worrying about TVL, as I said, because it's actually a wrong metric. It is the amount of activity and the amount of active users that will be determining the kind of who is going to be making money and having a viable business in the future and who won't. Probably two guests there as well, like total value secured there is, is an interesting metric to have as well. Web3 has a really cool and blockchain has a unique ability to unlock value that has never been value before, right? Like that's what I think this digital ownership is the multi-trillion dollar industry that is untapped right now. You have you sweat and has, oh, real quick, do I, do I say your company, sweat, sweat economy, sweat wallet? What do you, what's your like branding real quick? Just so like sweat economy is the name for our web three business that includes sweat token and sweat wallet. We spend a lot of time talking about sweat wallet. But for us, it's actually a tool and a vehicle to create utility and value for sweat, because this is where the real magic is. And this is the story that is a little bit harder to tell, but fundamentally we borrowed the page from the book of attention economy. That is a $7 trillion economy and it is built around you paying attention. And we realize that you paying attention and you being physically active are extremely similar, both beneficial to you, both have third parties that benefit from it and are willing to pay for it, and both are scarce. And if attention or paying attention 
is an asset that we managed to build $7 trillion economy around, then why on earth don't we have a multi-trillion dollar economy around being physically active? And this is such a simple and easy thing to understand. And then you go like, well, it will exist. But what our interest is, is to make sure that it's not as screwed up as attention economy, because in attention economy, Google takes your attention, sells it to the highest bidder, pockets all the money, and all you get is two gigs free with your Gmail. That's not an economy, that's a freaking robbery. But if we tokenize physical activity with our validation and verification protocol, and we give you the value, then that changes your behavior more, that creates more movement, that creates bigger externalities, and it pushes value created heck of a lot greater, and you don't end up building big tech, which is, you know, kind of right now, it's kind of an issue because, you know, kind of they have their own agendas, they have, you know, kind of country-sized budgets, and, you know, arguably some of the decisions and some of the things they're driving are not necessarily for the betterment of humanity. Yeah, they have country-sized budgets because they didn't share any of that value with any of the users. They've just been harvesting humans like time and attention where your approach is flipping it and saying, here's your physical economy or like, a, you know, yeah. physical activity. Yeah, you know, movement you, you economy, we call it. centralize the profits. Yeah, yeah. And sweat wallet is the mechanism to create utility and value. But we, when we went live, we have committed that at least 50% of all profits we make go into token purchases on the open market. And we want to funnel more and more of this value in because that's going to make token more valuable. That's going to make more people go, shit, I definitely need to move. That creates a lot of value because look, your insurer is extremely happy. The amount of value created there is phenomenal. Healthcare providers, we already have contract with NHS in the UK that pays us for people who diagnose with diabetes syndrome to become more active because that prevents them from falling into diabetes state, saves on life expectancy, saves on health span, saves on healthcare costs, you know, because insulin, et cetera, et cetera. Then if you start thinking of employers, employers understand very well absenteeism, productivity, morale in the office, mental health, are better off with more active uh, employees. And a lot of them are investing into it already. Ultimately, being active extends your health span by five to seven years. That means you're going to be economically active for longer. That means you're going to pay more taxes. Even in the most cynical financial sense, it is actually good business for countries to invest into physical activity of their citizens because they will get that back over a longer economic lifespan of that human. So sweat sweat economy is a derivative of how many how much people walk in the world. So if you have a thesis about whether people are going to walk or not, you, you can actually position yourself in terms of sweat economy. But it's it's kind of funny. Um, you know, it's like Bitcoin is like how you store when you're like running your compute electricity in a computer this is how you store your movement in a computer which is kind of interesting way to think about it but sweat is an app that on the surface seems like a pedometer but it's so much more and so much deeper and a gateway to to what is a new sort of unlock which is physical activity economy and you've done a ton of work for decade making sure this is safe protected accurate and mobile friendly and straight up beautiful. It is a very, like I, I've, I've used it. It's a very, it's one of the top. And you have over 150 million users, 154 million or some wild number. And it's growing all the time. I think I'm editing a video of you currently and I have to keep changing the numbers on it. <laughs> and then, and, and so that's sort of the base. You're using near to add to your business model and the the wallet allows you to do chain abstraction. Near allows you to do chain abstraction, which opens up a whole new world that will allow people to have their own ownership over their physical activity, economy, profits, or tokens and stuff like that. 
That's kind yeah. of a, a loose thing, right? Like that seems it. Yeah. T a tiny little sort of commentary around the edges. The Web2 business or Web2 app is Sweat Coin, and despite the name, it's not crypto. And the objective of that is track and verify your steps. And then this data flows into the movement verification oracle. And if it is genuine and verified, then it pushes an instruction into a smart contract to issue you sweat on the basis of constantly rising minting difficulty. So every next sweat requires more steps to walk than the one before. And everyone is in a competitive situation, which means that the earlier you walk and the more you walk, the better return on movement you get. On the flip side, from economics perspective, what it does is like Bitcoin halving, but that one is every four years. Here is just a really slow and gradual in real time that increases marginal cost of production. When you have an increase in marginal cost of production, ultimately that results in appreciation of that asset value. That's why we have it there, right? Typical tokens in Web3 have focused on utility and how you use them or what benefit they give you or, you know, kind of what can you derive out of them? We, of course, have that. And that's why we have rewards, why we have grow jars, why we have games, and we're constantly innovating and pushing more and more utility out there. But there is one very interesting difference in sweat versus pretty much all other tokens, which is you have an emotional relationship with it because it's your sweat tokenized. And that means that you at never at no point does user think that this asset can be zero. Because it didn't come to you through airdrop. It didn't come to you just sort of miraculously appearing. Somebody sent it to me or, you know, can it just appeared out of thin air that makes people kind of go magic money. No, I sweated over it. I know it cannot be zero. And that's the reason why we have this humongous advantage over a lot of other assets where our users know that it is valuable. And that's why majority of them are holding it and storing it because they know that they are not active for what one cent, which is a current price. And you know what? My mission is to make sure that they are more active. And in order for that to happen, we need to raise awareness of the real value of physical utility and understand that 30 years ago, we would have had very similar conversation about attention. Now, nobody really doubts that attention has tangible and very, very high financial value. So we're about 30 years behind attention, but we also have humongous technological advantage that we don't have to build these convoluted structures of tracking and exchanging and building products that give you value in exchange for attention. We can just tokenize it and make it into a liquid asset and everyone can participate in this economy and drive adoption a heck of a lot faster. To draw this home and to help people understand the value of it, we just engaged three different universities that are known for their work in the health space and physical activity space and the impact of physical activity on longevity, productivity, mental health, etc. And we went to them and we said, so if we ask you a question, how much? Would you be able to answer it? And they kind of went, nobody asked us before, but yeah. So we allocated academic grants to them. And these guys are working right now on basically coming up with arm's length estimates what is the value of 10,000 steps to individual? What is the value of 10,000 steps to businesses, corporates, you know, basically commercial enterprises? What is the value to healthcare providers? What is the value to governments? Because it's, you know, kind of, if we want to kick it off, we cannot come up with estimates, but when it's completely unbiased, you know, kind of ethical, you know, entities that are doing their own independent research. You know, that's going to be a heck of a lot more interesting. We just want to kick it off by saying, look, these are the numbers that we're going to get to. Are we going to get there in six months, in a year, or in two years? We don't know. But the only question is how long. And there is another element, which is the value of attention over the last 10 years 
has been going up and up and up and up. And whatever estimate we're coming with right now, in 10 years time, when we actually build a lot more economic exchange around it, it is going to be higher than this. So I just want to build an asset that can power these exchanges and then convince more and more parties to start participating and accepting it as a consideration for information services products. What a project that's uh, this. Uh, the, now that we're at the end of this uh, conversation, man, I'm just like, like I knew what swell was. I'm deep in it, but now I'm like, now I get the vision and uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and uh, sharing it. Thank and, you. Yeah. Can't wait to see what you're doing. Dude. I can't wait to see it keep going. And uh, after this, I'm going to go Thank walk you. now. I'm going to go walk, try to get my 20,000. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Yeah, Absolutely. All the time on podcasts.